Thank you. Hey. Good morning. Good morning, Patrick. Happy Earth Day, Bandana. Thank you for making me your date on Earth Day. Oh I my gosh. Cheers. I couldn't think of a better, more beautiful day to have on Earth Day. <laughs> So exciting. I put on my jazzy earrings, I've got glass. <laughs> I haven't dressed up this much <laughs> in a long time. In a long so time. COVID times. COVID. This is the, co the look for COVID. Doo, 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 doo. Yeah, when really. Was, when was the last time you left the house? Well, in <laughs> Indonesia and in Bali, where I live right now, it's not as strict as, let's say, countries, uh, uh, cities like New York and uh, perhaps Sydney and Melbourne. We are, uh, I mean, there is social distancing and all that, but I can go to the paddy field for a walk. <clears throat> um, I live in a villa community. So I have mm. kids running into my villa. You know, and they can. So since I moved from Bombay well, to let's Bali. Let's tell everybody a little bit about you who may not know. So everybody that's joining, we, first of all, we have an incredible global community joining us today with Thank Latin you. Fashion Summit. And we're so, first of all, so excited, Bandana, to be chatting with you. You're such an incredible activist voice and just an all around beautiful human being who is out there pushing. As you are. As you are. Thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we're so excited to chat with you. So our community um, from around the world uh, is excited to chat with you. So I'd love for you to just to give a little bit of a top line of like, how you got to Bali because you actually worked in the fashion industry and maybe we'd start there. So tell us how, how did you get to Bali? Sure. Yeah. Um, I continue to work in the fashion industry, but I, I work um, in the way that I want to now, which is of course uh, being a sustainability activist. But before I reached Bali, I lived in Bombay mm -hmm. in a city of more than 20 million people. Mm -hmm. It was full on hustle and bustle and parties and events, you name it. It was uh, a time I worked with Vogue. I loved my time working with Vogue. I worked with Vogue India for 13 years. I had the privilege of interviewing the best of the creative minds, not only within my country, but also outside, mm -hmm. whether it was Karl Lagerfeld or John Galliano or you name it. Um, so it was a great privilege, but I did that for 13 years and um, a few things started changing for me because I don't forget where I come from. I am from India. I'm, I'm Nepalese, so I'm from the Himalayas. Um, I'm a mountain goat. I grew up in India. You're a mountain I'm goat. <laughs> a mountain goat. A really and gorgeous, a really beautiful mountain goat. I think the most beautiful I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, you know, we are, we are not, ne we are, we are fierce women, we are, we are, you know, Nepalese women from up in the Himalayas, we, we are fierce. That's mm -hmm. why I don't have a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we won't get into that. But you, I, got the, you got this date today, so I'm your boyfriend today, proudly. The, <laughs> most, the most authentic date I could have hoped for on Earth Day, you, Patrick. Um, so, yeah, living in India, it, it's a you start questioning yourself because if you walk on the streets, it is very apparent that there is abject poverty and incredible wealth on the street. Hide under the you it's there facing you. So after 13 years of being uh, working for a wonderful mainstream luxury magazine that is all about beautiful products. It starts, you know, I started questioning myself. This has got nothing to do with the company that I worked with or other people. This was my personal journey. I started feeling guilty. Mm -hmm. I started questioning, is this how I want to spend my time? If I can convince someone to buy a watch that costs $5,000, I wonder if I can ask the same person, you know how much value that money has for you mm -hmm. to spend it 
on a village community that would give electricity for three months with the same amount of money. Yeah. Because I lived in India, mm. you know? So it was just my own personal uh, introspection and my own journey that made me want to change the course. Was it and hard to actually make that shift? Was it hard to let that all go? I think what made it really easy for me to change my course was when I decided to move from Bombay to live in a jungle in Bali. So I keep saying jungle in Bali because it really is. Where I live, it really is a jungle. The paddy fields at the back and, you know, you could be completely very isolated. The opposite of what my life was in Bombay. I love Bombay, don't get me wrong. But I think I need it in my life move to Bali. And when you come here, I wish I could show you where I live. I've got fruits growing all around. I've got paddy fields at the background. There's so much nature, you know, that you are so grounded in your earthiness that it's easy then to make that shift in your consciousness and say, okay, I can still be within the industry, but I can take the route to talk about mindfulness in the luxury business, conscious consumption over mm. conspicuous consumption. It became a very organic move in that direction. Mm. And I have to give it to Mama Bali for giving me that space to challenge myself, to, to take a chance yeah. on just having a different perspective in the very industry that I just so that's where I am. I live in Bali. I'm a sustainability actor. I still write fashion. I still for the twenty very do. Um, but I honestly don't the gumption anymore to write about blue is the new black story. It doesn't interest me whatsoever. Clothing for clothing's sake how does, doesn't interest me. Give how me does a that, purpose. So you talked about the pause, actually. This is really an interesting question. So you talked about the pause to get to Bali. There's a big pause in the fashion industry now, in the world now. Oh, wait, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> I'm actually drinking wine and you're having water. It's nine o'clock at night. I mean, I deserve this. That's okay. I should be drinking wine too, but this is this is Mother Earth's champagne right here, sparkling water. So, um, so we'll toast every time. Every time I see you take a sip, I'll take a sip too. Okay. So let's get to that pause because the world is kind of on pause right now, unexpectedly. What has that pause been like? for you with this COVID crisis? And what has that pause been like for you kind of in this world of fashion and fashion activism and, and being? What, what's wrong with well, my life is that much because of COVID, because I was, I moved to Bali. I work on my own. I miss going out to clubs and having one of those crazy weekends when the best DJ in Berlin arrive in, in Bali and you know, you go all the time. I miss that. Yeah. But on regular days, I work on my own. I have to research on my own. I have to hustle for my work on my own because I don't have a corporation behind me. I, I work on my own. So there are a lot of things that I haven't changed. I'm, I'm excited about this pause because now, I feel like everyone else is doing it too. Yeah. You know, inadvertently, I had started doing it, you know, without COVID. And now it, it just feels like I feel connected because everyone is going through the same thing. So this pause has allowed me, A, to appreciate my journey. And I'm not saying this in a pompous way. My journey as a sustainability activist could not have meant more than now, when everyone is sitting at home contemplating what, what matters to us. What is a value? What is a value is good health? What is a value is being surrounded or being connected to your loved ones? A small community of people, not a wide arena 
of our social antiques that we were also used to in the fashion world, right? So health, loved ones. Are you losing me? Uh-oh. May have lost her for a minute there. <coughs> Hang on. My back? Oh, dear. Patrick, I think it's, it's your screen. We can hear you perfectly. I'm still there, right? Yes, we can see you. Oh, okay, okay. Because I'm the one in the jungle, so I always get worried. No, no, you're amazing. We're just checking on, our, on, our, on Patrick. I think he lost connection. Yeah, so I think uh, Patrick is going to connect again. Um, yeah. Okay. So if you want, you can keep on um, talking okay. about, yeah, that, so we don't lose focus. Okay. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, I was just saying that, especially with COVID-19, I feel like my purpose has grown stronger in the way that I want to live my life, in the way that I want to work, in what I want to dis disseminate, what I uh, would love people to engage in. And as a writer, as a journalist, what I want to write about has to have much more gravitas, has to have much more authenticity um, than what I'd done before because we are living in a time where we are thinking about death almost every day. Each one of us is thinking about death in the way that we've never thought about. Yet, we've forgotten what, what it does mean to have the dignity of death. We are so scared that we've never confronted death. We always think about living a good life. How do we live, live, live? But the most inevitable thing that happens, which is death, we are not prepared for. So, can I talk about all these very meaningful, deep ideas within the job that I do, and which, which is, a life, as, as a lifestyle journalist, there is no reason why I should not be able to talk about the fashion business, the clothing business, and talk about spiritual practices at the same time. So sorry. Oh, you're back. Sorry. Let's cheers to that. Yes, <laughs> cheers to that. I don't know what happened. Mm. That's okay. Okay. Now, before we, can we do this cheers to Prince? Oh, can we do this cheers to Prince? Yes. Because... Bradana, cheers to Prince. Make the toast. What are we toasting? Who are we to what, what we're toasting Prince. Oh, uh, Prince. The incredible musician. Okay. Your... Today is his death anniversary. Yeah. What's your favorite Prince song? Uh, purple Rain. Purple Rain. Purple Rain. Purple Rain. That's a beautiful one. I think mine Not just is my favorite Prince song. My favorite song is, is Purple Rain. Yeah. Mine, I think, is Diamonds and Pearls. <laughs> I like Diamonds and Pearls. Oh, I love that. Diamonds and Pearls. Since we're talking about the fashion industry, <laughs> you know what? We should probably have a karaoke, karaoke show. That's what we should do. Okay, so back to, I lost Ooh. you somewhere, but I think let's talk, I, I heard you say the word value, because what we're talking about today is we're kind of talking about, the, about creativity and we're talking about value and we're talking about how we're looking at the world now moving forward. So I think maybe the first thing that we can look at is like, there's been a huge issue with value in the fashion industry, especially because of how we, like you were mentioning before, the $50,000 for that watch or the $50,000 that can go into a community. How is, how are we, how is how we looked at items and how we looked at people, how's that value changed, first of all? And, and where do you think we can, we should be going with that now? I mean, you know, this, the idea of sustainability, a lot of people ask me, like, oh my gosh, 
is it about not buying anything at all? I was like, no, it's not about not buying. We need, we, we, we are human beings. We love things that are beautiful. Um, but we gave so much credence to the product and placed product before people. We put product before process. We put product before purpose. So we made fashion quite faceless. And mm. we made it into a very, we dehumanized fashion because it was all about a logo. It was about the acquisition, the power of the acquisition. And so it is not about not buying at all. It is what, let's define what value is. And the more you deep, you sort of, you put your feet into a cultural experience, when you sort of get your hands dirty into the craft world, it, you can see who made it and how it was made, what are the processes. I think we start, we, we become more aware of what real value means. Mm -hmm. I live in Indonesia, you know. I remember going down to Sumba, which is a beautiful island, and going into the village community, as I've done in several villages in India, and seeing how the ikats are made. And you see the community that makes it. You look at. You can talk to the grandmother, who's very much part of, and engaged in the process. You can have kids running around. You see the whole ecosystem of creativity. Now that ikat fabric that I picked up is something I will never throw away. Yeah, I can reinvent it. I can turn it into a jacket, um, but it's something that I will value all my life. So we have to give that level of authentic narrative to the things that we buy. It's not that we should not buy anymore. This is an industry that has given so much job opportunities to millions of people, especially in developing countries. So we should be very uh, careful and respectful of the business of fashion because yeah. it does more good. We talk about how harmful it is, but it's a $4 trillion industry that empowers people yeah and jobs and how does that so like and we're talking with um a big a big part of what happens in latin america and all over the world and where you are is you know craft and is you know those people that are that are spending hours and hours and hours making weaving or beading or doing those intricate details and they're getting and the and, and they're getting paid nothing and we're paying nothing for their product but meanwhile a Balenciaga flip-flop will pay $250 for. So where does, that's, excuse me for saying this, but that's effed up. Like, why has that happened? And why, it how is do effed, we, up. How, effed up, why, do, why is that happening? And how do we change that? I mean, is that flip-flop worth $250? Maybe, maybe not. What are we paying for with that? And why aren't we, why aren't we seeing the value of human life and the value it, of all the hours that the people are painstakingly weaving? Why aren't, why aren't we valuing that? Well, it's effed up 100%. <laughs> We've been regurgitating the bullshit that's been indoctrinated to us by powerful companies that take ownership over cultures and people, not keeping in mind the cultural integrity of the places where things are made by hand. All South American countries have incredible artisanal skills. Mm -hmm. We have um, the Indian subcontinent, Asia. The whole silk route trading, you know, was based on the fact that it was an exchange in the cross-pollination of ideas between countries and those ideas were all culturally entrenched, not something that came out of a factory per se. It would be made by hand. It would be, have been passed down by generations. But we stopped valuing that because our narrative changed. I worked, I continue to work in the, in, um, in the media and media have, like I feel we need to be beholden to a bigger purpose now because we are the very people who taught the entire world about seasonal fashion, fast fashion. Mm -hmm. Green is the new blue, blue is the new black, black is the new thing, 60s is in, 70s is in, 80s. We, as media people, have regurgitated that bullshit over and over. 
over again and yeah. then uh, never ever in what real fashion is which is cultural fashion which yeah. is about um an authenticity that comes from your cultural provenance mm -hmm. your sartorial provenance um yeah. so the narrative has to change so now that it's slowed down and people are like literally stuck and forced to, to stop and take a look not only at themselves but at industries i mean everybody now is like saying what are, where do we go how do we move this forward what the f wtf like big ones so is this an opportunity for us to kind of reconnect culturally is this an opportunity for us to look at what's happening in our own backyards whether it's in bali or in latin america or even the craftspeople of italy or portugal or france or you know is this an opportunity for us to reconnect with that and use creativity or, or look at creativity as a way to help us get out of this craziness that we're in right now oh 100 percent the fact is whether the vaccine is developed quickly or not travel is not going to be as easy as it was mm -hmm. in the past right i mean you you traveled a lot because i know work. i was planning on coming to your house today i know <laughs> guess that's not happening <laughs> well 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 it could when things open up but you may have to choose wisely it yeah. would be instead of the five trips that you're going to do and we, we were both doing that yeah, yeah, we were on the one hand for sustainability, but I was in a different country every month. I didn't even think about my carbon footprint of travel, none of that. So we will travel, but we will be traveling more consciously. Mm -hmm. And so now that we know that we're not going to be traveling that much, I really think it's an amazing opportunity for designers to look into their own backyard for inspiration for supply chain. So the whole idea that the things that we were wearing right now goes to five different countries. The t-shirt that you wear, for instance, mm -hmm. the cotton must have been grown in Bangladesh. It must have been beaten and turned into yarn in another country. Then it's sent to another country for dyeing, another country for cutting and uh, turning them into textiles and uh, fabrics and turning them into t-shirts and then being sent to New York where someone screen prints, I love New York and we buy it for $2.55. That's the reality of the clothing business pre COVID. Mm -hmm. So now do you think that's going to be a possibility? So it's a wonderful time for designers to look into their own cultural provenance, their own sartorial inheritance and deep dive into things that we ignored and deliberately ignored in the face of globalization, modernization, homogenization. Mm. We forgot that we don't need to be similar. Mm. The world is wonderful because we are dissimilar, that we are culturally different from each other, that it is okay. We, look at us. We were living in a world which is all about a uniform. We are in a tease, jumpers, sneakers, hoodies, whatever. We started finding this. It's like eating McDonald's everywhere in the world. Now, mm. is that good food? Mm. But then suddenly the whole world is like, oh, we're all so similar. We don't need to be similar. We need to be culturally proud. We need to take ownership over our own provenance and celebrate the difference and invite people to participate in a culture that you know anything about. Yeah, I love that. That is so amazing. So um, we're, I'm, we're getting a couple questions now that are popping in, so I'm gonna ask you a couple of these. So, okay, good question. Can we make sustainable fashion and cultural handcrafts or can we make culture, cultural uh, goods like we're talking about? Can we make those, uh, let's see, sorry. Can we make cultural handcrafts as popular, this is interesting, as popular as fast fashion. Companies want to make money and consumers want responsibly priced fashion fixes. How is this compatible? Interesting. What would happen if we made, what do you think would happen if we made these culturally 
sound projects or handcraft projects or artisanal products as popular as fast fashion? Would that solve the problem, you think? It's a good question. It's a great question, and thank you for that. Um, yes, of course we should be making cultural uh, items popular and mainstream. But one thing that we have to understand is when you say cultural products, yeah. which means it's made by hand, it's handcrafted, that requires time. That requires patience. When you're talking about a beautiful piece of garment that is being stitched by hand, the embroideries are being done in any part of any one of the Latin American countries or in India. That takes time. It's human hands that's doing it. It's not a machine. Right. So the idea of making it like blow up as like fast fashion did. Why did fashion, fast fashion become so um, sort of endemic and moved so quickly in less than 10 years to literally consume us in our minds is because it is run by a system, a, a machinery of production and manufacturing that actually doesn't value the made by hand. So do we want cultural products to be out there in mainstream? 100% yes. But we cannot then equate them to fast fashion because understanding a cultural item is understanding the value and the time, the, the quality, not the quantity. So if we start putting cultural items in the same bucket as fast fashion, then it defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. it it really defeats the purpose. Then we go back to a system which is going to marginalize people. Then we can go back where people become numbers. Factory workers become, literally, they, you may as well be tattooed into a number. And then we get into the whole human rights issues. of Is it a good enough wage? Is it a living wage? What are the conditions that they're working in? Cultural items should not follow in that. We shouldn't follow the same paradigm that fast fashion did. Mm -hmm. Cultural items should be mainstream, but it should come with the same value for which it, was, it began in the first place. Yeah. It was done by generations of people. It was passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. It was about time, quality, not the speed of making things. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And, you know, if we were to value that, that would mean that we'd probably be investing in those people and investing in those chains of people that are making those, you know, beautiful goods. So the interesting question is like, so, you know, there, the, the indigenous and artisan communities are oftentimes the ones that are in this fashion value or supply chain are the ones that are hardest hit with something like COVID. So, you know, let's look at the, let's look at, I want to ask you, like, what would it be like if we would be investing into these communities and how would that work? And with something like COVID now, you know, we've been seeing that these fast fashion brands, for instance, who are responsible for a massive percentage of, of, the, of revenue in the fashion industry have just rescinded their orders. And some of them are stepping up the plate now after a lot of banging on the doors for them to take some, take action. But you know, first of all, that's a, a whole nother question, but how is the investment into in the investment into them looking as a way forward? How is it, how can we support these types of communities and these types of brands and invest into them so they can actually have a healthy business. So then when something ha healthy business, healthy lives, healthy communities, so that when something like a COVID crisis pops up, they're not left destitute. The big question, I guess. It's a big question. It's about investing big in question, and I'm too tiny a person <laughs> to, uh, to answer this with any kind of credibility. But as a lay person, as a consumer, as someone who I feel a sense of empathy for every Bangladeshi factory worker today who's been laid off because ten massive brands from the developed world decided to seize their orders and they bring an entire nation to a crippling halt. Mm. I find that disgraceful. And so I think the very perpetrators, these big companies, the very companies that have given job opportunities to millions of people in developing countries need to change their systems. 
I can't rely. I mean, I don't think it's about the ownership should not go to young designers, solitary designers, small, you know, upcoming designers. They're not the ones who they, they can have sustained practices in their business. Yes, but they are not there to solve the problem that was created by fast fashion. Mm -hmm. So very fast fashion companies that employ the people of the world in developing nations because they are the the developing nations are the manufacturers for the affluent world. I mean, more than 80% of the clothes that are worn in America is made outside America in mm -hmm. countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, Cambodia, Indonesia. It is, the onus is on these companies to straighten the damn system mm -hmm. because we don't want the factory workers to lose their jobs. And we are grateful that you know, you've created an industry which empowers them and allows them to have these jobs, but not at the cost of their human rights. Mm. And now we really are talking about human rights. Yep. They've just been ditched in the wayside right now. Do you think that's going to change? <sighs> you know. The machinery is strong, right? <laughs> the machinery is heavy, man. Mm -hmm. um, in my idealist world, I wish and I hope and I think it will change because how the hell do you live with a bloody conscience when you know what kind of damage you cause not only to the environment, but to the people who make the clothes that make you into billionaires, right? So how do you live with that? But you don't, I, mean, I don't know, greed is greed. You know, I don't have too much money, so I suppose it's easy for me to talk about greed as a very sort of esoteric money. It's like, oh, well, you know, when one has it, one has it. I, I don't have anything to cover it. I don't have a big bank balance that I have to like worry about. So I don't know what it must mean to someone who is trying to keep his whole billion dollar business in place, but... I hope that they have a conscience mm. because if nothing else, COVID-19 is a reminder that it doesn't fucking matter if you're a billionaire or you're a pauper, you are as susceptible to be ill with the same virus and perhaps lose your life in the same way someone who doesn't have any medical aid can. Yeah. So... Let's look at some of these, thank you for that. Let's look at um, some of the positives here for a quick moment, not quick, but for a moment. So who are some of the brands or some of the companies that you think are doing a great job or doing a good job or admirable job in this system? Not just about the communication of their sustainable practices, but are actually kind of doing it right. So like that can provide provide us a little bit of a template, if you will, of how a brand, big or small, could work. Is there any, any top of mind that you might know of? I mean, you know, all the brands that I know that are working hard, who have a conscience to try as much as they can to be sustainable. And, you know, when I say sustainable, like, it, it just drives me crazy after a while because no one is sustainable. No brand is sustainable. There's a carbon footprint in anything that we make. And as human beings, we have a carbon footprint by just the act of living. But I like to talk about responsible fashion, you know, mm -hmm. because it gives you a lot of leeway to sort of access and engage with good practices that are going to be less harmful to the environment. So I, I can't, of course, I know certain brands that are working hard at it and they are mostly small brands mm -hmm. they are these are not multi million dollar brands that are making big changes these are young upcoming designers in countries all over the world in latin america in india in indonesia mm -hmm. they, they are developing their own model i find them exemplary in the way if you ask me, what's that one big brand? Hard you to know, think apart of. Apart from Patagonia. Yeah. I... But that's, that's interesting, isn't it? 
we can't think of any. <laughs> Don't you think it should be, there should be a list. It should be one, two, three, four, five. We should be going to that. So, you know. I mean, there is Salam Atatni and there are, there are like, you know, but I'm talking about conglomerates, the ones yeah. that own so many of these brands and, and, and the conglomerates that run the system. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Go for it. Run the damn system, man. But like, just man up and address the issues of our times. How long do you think you're going to pillage the earth mm. for a handbag or a shoe? Like, are they investing enough in sustainable fabrics? Are they promoting innovative practices? Are they looking into what are the alternatives to the kind of fabrics and uh, textiles that they could use? Are they, are they even giving money to research and development and raising funds for a better world with better innovative sustainable practices? Are they? Mm. Or if they are, is it perfunctory? Is it actually making a big impact? Yeah. So like in investing into, you know, for, we're talking about fair trade as a solution. So a uh, question from Allison from the New York City Fair Trade about um, environmental and social uh, justice uh, as a solution. Like, Fair trade in the current economic environment and social justice climate is a real solution. How would you go about starting a conversation and applying healthy business practices to support fair trade? That's a good question. So how does fair trade work within this construct, within this? You know, I'm not, I'm not a policymaker, mm -hmm. so I don't have the... the Sadly, I don't have the language or the terminology to um, propose a solution. But as a human being, I certainly do. Yeah. As a human being, fair trade for me means don't have abusive practices in your business model, right? Yeah. And when it becomes to a lay person like me, fair trade means that we have to talk about fair trade when there's a power imbalance between the, the ones who are manufacturing, the owners of these big companies and the people who are making for your company with their sweat and blood. So I'm not a policy person. I love the question so much and I wish I'd studied more to answer this intelligently. But I do understand that on a humanitarian level, on a humane level, it's big brands really need to, it's not about the small brands. Small brands are fucking cool, man. I know that they're starting their business practices in a way that should be done, planting the seed of sustainability as they grow. So sustainability flowers and blossoms along with their business. It's the big brands that have amassed billions of dollars and still don't take the responsibility. And they're the ones who are working with governments. They're the ones who are in cahoots with policymakers, uh, bankers, investors, you name it. You know, we want to talk about fair trade. I think it needs to go to policy level. The government needs to change. There are governments in developing countries that will deliberately allow the marginalization of its own people because it serves a bigger corporate um, agenda, yeah. yeah, business agenda, right? Yeah. So policy, policy is the key for fair, fair trade. And we need governments that look after their people when very strong, powerful companies come to manufacture in their countries. Yeah, very good point. So, you know, you know, talking about that pause button, we're all kind of pausing. We've all been on the pause mode for a little bit. And we're starting to see people kind of come out of it. And of course, like you said, you know, we need to sell. We need, you know, we need buying and we need selling. We need an economy. And there's many, many people out there that are saying, stop buying new. And, I'm, you know, I'm not super convinced that that's a solution. We need to be very conscious about what we're buying for sure. But 
you know, right? So n no, new isn't bad. It's about the consciousness and about how that was made and how the provenance of how that all came together and the fair, the fairness and the- I absolutely. Yeah. So when- I absolutely but, agree with you. It's not so, about- Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, no, I'm just saying you're right. It's, it's not about not wanting to buy new. You know, we are human beings and we are creative human beings. We all, over time, want to believe that we are aesthetes, you know, in this universe. So we want to acquire, uh, possess, whatever it is, beautiful things, beautiful experiences. But, and I speak about this a lot, which is today, given COVID times, um, <laughs> This product for product's sake seems a little redundant, right? Just beauty for beauty's sake, design for design's sake. Beauty without a purpose? Right now? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Give me a designer handbag right now. It means nothing to me. Nothing at all. Because I've got other things to take care of that are fundamental to my livelihood and my sanity. So... The things that we buy tomorrow is not about not having them as beautiful, aesthetically superior, blah, blah, But I really, really, really believe that if we buy a product tomorrow, if we can understand the process, so we respect the entire value chain and the hands, the invisible hands and faces that have touched the beautiful product that we've bought, and beyond process, if we can understand what the purpose is, how does it give back to a community? So it's product, process, purpose. If these three key elements can come together as a beautiful, cohesive whole, yes, I will buy that product. But just product for product's sake, like how we were consuming before, which is just the right bag, the it shoe, the it, the it, the it, forget it. At least to me personally, it's it's regressive. I cannot go back into that world anymore. Yeah. I want to buy the good thing. I want to buy the beautiful thing, but I also want to know how it's made, where it's made, where's the money going, and what purpose does it serve? Creativity uh, is useless if we uh, don't change people's lives. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good one. The product process purpose let's get a let's get a toast to that cheers <laughs> bandana beautiful so now taking that into consideration yes girl yes i can hear everybody clapping in the background so product process purpose yes yeah <laughs> there's a little speaker back here amazing that's that, that's like yeah. You know what? It's so simple, and it, it's so, it's so simple in its concept, but difficult, I think, for people to really understand how to get there. So there's a, a so many incredible brands like we talked about before, small ones that uh, small ones and medium sized ones or and big ones that are that are focusing on that. However, right now is an important time because we are in a time where we can clearly cut and move forward in, in a fresh and new way. So when we're talking about creativity, right. it's gonna take creativity and you talk a lot about this to get us out of this mess or to help journey. And maybe it's not about, let's not, let's not try to solve the problem with this conversation, but let's look at how is creativity gonna steer the, turn the direction of the ship, how can creativity do that? I know you talk a lot about that. So can, we, can you share some of your thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, creativity comes from an individual will. What we forget is that we always, like sustainability, it becomes such a wide topic that um, people start thinking that somebody else is going to come and solve the problem for you, right? When we talk about creativity, it's, it's a human being that is creating something. So I find it baffling when people refuse to change, when 
the time has come to change. I mean, COVID-19 is making it so brutally honest. We are so naked in front of, uh, you know, either we change or we die. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, who was it? Harold Wilson said, if we don't change, we are the architects of decay. And COVID-19 has made it amply clear that is true. But we always think in terms of institutions, corporations, this amorphous um, group of people that have no control over things, or it's just so huge. But we forget all that. And we talk about individual will, and we talk about individual intention, and we start making the change as a creative person, as a consuming person. Um, if we make that change as an, in, an intention, a manifestation that comes, literally I'm talking about in a very spiritual way, as a spiritual quest not to harm the environment and the people that surround us. I just don't find that a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Moments we make it about something so huge, if every individual thought about change in that manner, that I am the custodian of the environment, of the earth, I'm the custodian of a great company with all those people working under me, I'm the custodian in the sense, not in a pompous way, but custodian for their rights, just like I would like my rights to be adhered to. We keep thinking in terms of like systems, systems, governments, corporations taking over. We need to look deep into our own consciousness and start making incremental changes individually for social change. Because I think that's when the collective force comes in. These are the, the best revolutions in the world that changed the course of history began like that. It didn't start off with the government. It didn't start off with some. It started because individual will willed it. So I am a bit of a, sure, I'm an idealist, but I also find myself radical in how I believe that indiv individuality, individual choice, um, and individual will can make more change than waiting for a government to solve the problem for you. Mm. Wow. The big one. The prince. <laughs> yeah, to print. Holy, holy shit. I had to really sit on that one for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so just looking at uh, quite some as I'm kind of digesting what you just said, which is very powerful, looking at some questions. Fern Malice, raise the freaking roof to Fern, we love her, has joined. And um, she's talking about, she says, what are one, some things, one or two things that we can leave the discussion with uh, to make a positive change? So let's look at that. Thank you, Fern, for the question. Also, thank you everybody else that has submitted questions. There's so many, I can't get to them all. Um, we'll try to follow up with answers to questions in, a, in an email that we can send out tomorrow. But Fern says, um, what's one or two things that everyone can leave this discussion with in their lives to make a positive change? So let's look at that from the consumer level, from the consumer side. Let's also look at that from the brand. What? Is it Fern Malice? What? Yeah, Fern Malice. Fern. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Hi, <laughs> Hi Fern. I love and, and we love Fern because she, she really is she really is a driver. I mean, she really is somebody who changed the landscape of fashion in the world. Can I, Patrick, can I tell you, Fern started Fashion Week in India. And, you know, she was the queen of Fashion Weeks. I mean, she created a garland of Fashion Weeks all over the world, that she, where, wherever she went. She is the most kind, compassionate, engaged person in the fashion industry. And she's been a huge, huge supporter of Indian designers, a huge champion for the crafts industry in India. And she wears Indian designers everywhere. And sometimes, you know, she is appalled by how we as Indians in a, 
craft-led country don't seem to value uh, the stuff that she does, not being part of the country. So I know Fernie very well. <laughs> and I love you, Fernie. Um, I think the, thing, uh, the question that you asked, what are the few things that we can change individually? That was the question, right? Yeah, individually, as con let's, but let's think as consumers and as a brand. So as a consumer and as a young brand. And, let's look and this will apply very well to Fernie. Okay. <laughs> Buy less. Buy less. Go on a fashion diet. We <laughs> are so famous for going on a carb diet, a juice diet, you name it. And, you know, intermittent fasting. We are cleansing our system all the time. And yet, we don't think that we need to be on a fashion diet. We, we've got to stop buying so much shit, man. we just got to stop buying. Buy things of value. Pay a little bit more because that little bit more means someone else is being paid a good salary in that supply chain. But we need to buy less. Go on a shopping diet. It's not doesn't mean that you don't have to buy at all a diet there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing that right? yeah what's in there's a great book, there's a great book. Uh, i forget the author but it's called suffocation we are suffocating with the stuff that we buy mm. so let's take a step back and look at our cupboards that are filled with things that we don't wear anymore and we're just stuffing it and stuff. We are suffocating ourselves with stuff. So it's fine to go on a shopping diet. <laughs> so <laughs> me, baby. Yeah. Me. I mean, I also like, I mean, the idea of the sharing economy, well, that's super creative. I love the idea of, you know, like what I do with swapping. And sure. that also, you know, helps you connect with people and helps you connect with communities. Um, so, you know, I love the idea of a fashion diet. Um, what do you think though for a young brand? That's like, you know, that's the challenge, I guess, for a young brand that needs to survive and, you know, that's out there right now struggling to survive. Like, how do they, what do they do? How do they, do they, how does, how does fashion, going on a fashion diet apply to them? I mean, is it, is it possible to have all of these brands that are out there? I mean, you know, one thing that I look at when I see these new crops of designers and I get so many people that are, you know, uh, saying, you know, what do you think of my brand or what do you think of my product? And there's a lot of really great, you know, good stuff out there, but there's also a lot of stuff out there that's like, why? So I guess why, you know, maybe the question is the fashion diet when we're talking to the industry and we're talking to brands and we're talking to designers, going back to those three things that you laid out before, purpose. What's the purpose of this design for you as a designer? Are you doing this just to be, to satiate your ego? Are you doing this to, what's, what's the purpose behind that? Do we need so many fashion brands out there? Now, I'm not one to say you should and you shouldn't. That's not, that's not it. But like, <laughs> But everybody now wants to be a designer. Everybody now wants to have a product. Everybody now wants to have a label. How does that fit into all of this? When you're saying we go on a fashion diet, like, what do you think? Well, you know what? There's a bigger, the, you know, usually when I say go on a fashion diet, it applies to things that we tend to buy very quickly because we've been, because it's cheap. So instead of buying one T-shirt, I, I can buy five, yeah. wear it once, and then, you know, dispose of it and not think about where it's going. The fact of the matter is that when we throw away anything, there's no away in throwing. You throw away, it has to go somewhere. Yeah. So that's what I find most dysfunctional because then you start thinking about, if you actually, in your heart, start thinking about, where everything that we buy goes once you're done with it then you really start you go into a like <laughs> you go into a loop right <laughs> because where does that brush that toothbrush go when i throw it away there's no away you just got one damn planet mm. like it'll go into the sea it'll go into a landfill that's it everything so 
this is not about not consuming. It is about buying things that you A, don't want to throw away, that you can pass down. The reason I say that the designers of tomorrow are hopefully other ones who don't believe in the, that paradigm of bigger is better, that you have to be everything to everyone. I think the designers of tomorrow will hone in their skills, focus, make it niche, mm. know their, their tribe, have a loyalty from their customer base, yep. and, and, and respect and value. So what they buy, they buy because it's not for disposal. The idea that you have to be so globalized that you have to be in every country and mm -hmm. you have to open doors day by day in the top cities of the world, that sounds obnoxiously <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> and we have seen that, how that ideology of consumerism has really fucked up the world. Mm. And COVID has shown us that. When mm. countries are coming to a standstill because the supply chain, the manufacturing, the, the developing countries and their aspirations, and it's come to a standstill. The mm -hmm. entire system did not work for us. So again, I'm an idealist. <laughs> I'm an idealist. I'm God. the big champion of designers who believe, who believe that bigger is not better and that, that, and that yeah that's and that's like you know going to back to the investing in culture you know the the creativity and the investing in the culture and that's something i think this is so important how do you you know as we're kind of coming to oh my god we've been on for an hour crazy how do you let's let's look at that how is investing in the culture of the people how is that important not only to the communities, but as a, as a way to communicate um, to the world? Like how, how is, because right now, are we really uh, doing Don't you think? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I feel like on a fundamental level, like forget like what's a new way of doing business and whatever. And fundamental level, if we ask ourselves, how rich do you want to be? How much wealth is enough, right? If we start questioning those fundamental truths, then we know I can have a good enough business that doesn't need to span five continents, doesn't have to have X amount of stores, that amount of inventory that probably doesn't get sold, then you have to burn it, and put in a landfill. Like, how rich do you want to be? This is an extraordinary time to ask these fundamental questions. How happy are you going to be with that amount of wealth that you get? So when we start thinking in those lines, then your business practice will change. Mm. That I am happy enough, enough. I'm rich enough. My employees are well looked after. That expanding and multiplying and really? Do yeah. we have the bandwidth anymore? Yeah. Are we going to go back after COVID-19 and become the kind of com the consumerist satans that we have been? Like, really, can this time teach us to just say, I am happy with there's a certain amount of wealth. But beyond that, what are you going to do? Like for all the wealth in the world, what are you going to do with all the yachts that you have right now? <laughs> can you travel anywhere? You can, where are you going to go? You Even with your money to go on first class flights anywhere in the world, you can't travel anywhere. Your passport is zilch right now. It means nothing. So then let's discuss what really fuels our creativity and a desire to create things is the idea goes right back to your ego what is enough yep what is enough right and and, and then you know what is it what is enough and then how does it go to to those are questions that you need to ask yourself to have a how do you have a sustainable business right what is enough what's important to me what's important to my business is it about taking care of the people that work with me or work for me or work for the brand or that we employ along the entire value chain or entire supply chain 
Is it about the environment? Like, so what are, what are some, as we kind of close out this conversation, that's a really good thing to, to end on, or some of your tips or some of your takeaways about the value and creativity and what should, be, what should people be looking at now as they move forward to have a sustainable business? Just some couple tips. So I guess we're talking about people and planet, environment, I, social and environmental. Yeah, let's go back to people. Let's go back to compassion, kindness, creativity with a purpose. You can make it edgy. You can make it sexy. Sustainability can be damn sexy. Yes. If you, if you wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've hold it. We've pigeonholed it for so long. It's like. As I keep telling everyone, you know, I'm done with magazines that's like, oh, February issue is a sustainable green issue. And then for 11 months, no one else talks about it. The <laughs> magazine doesn't. So let's get out of facetious way of looking at our own lives. We are talking about sustainability as if we are talking about people living in Mars. This is our planet. It's our sustainable lives that we are talking about. It's a planet that we want to leave our kids and other generations after us with dignity, with kindness. We keep talking as if like we don't belong in this. <laughs> we, we've distanced ourselves so much. So for whatever you're creating, it doesn't matter to me whether you are making jewelry or a piece of clothing or furniture. I think we need to understand that sustainability is something about a human being being sustainable human being. <laughs> you have to go back into your soul. You have to go back into you. It's, 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 this change comes from you. It's not the products that we create. It's an extension of me or of the, the creative person. But ultimately, the ideals of sustainability has to be entrenched in your heart. And I love quoting Gandhi. So <laughs> before you wrap up. Let's quote um, Gandhi. Um, yes. Let's do a lead. Yes. That's a good way to lead today. Yes. Yes. So yes. Gandhi. Cheers to Prince so and Gandhi. Gandhi. Talks Prince love. and Gandhi. <laughs> to very inspiring people. So Gandhi <laughs> talks about. Gandhi talks a lot about of his entire life was dedicated to the ideal or the principle of ahimsa, which means non-violence, which means non-violence in your thoughts, deeds, and actions. Now, when you say non-violent thoughts, acts, and deeds, he, he, in fact, there's a quote, he says, non-violence is not a garment that you put on and off at will. Its seat is in the heart and mm -hmm. must be followed through. So it is a change in consciousness. When you start thinking of nonviolence in that level, where you are nonviolent emotionally, productively, creatively, environmentally, where you are a human being that is empathetic to, in, to humanity, then your whole life purpose changes. How you create changes, right? You're just a kind of human being, compassionate. I feel for the tree. I feel for my neighbor. I bleed like my neighbor. It's the same damn blood. You know, what, which religion is saving us from COVID right now? Tell me. <laughs> Thank you. Who is saving us? You know, we've got to find our own center, our own consciousness that is aligned to a universal spirit that is not religious. I don't give a shit about religion, but it is secular. It is cosmic. I just feel we need to be elevated human beings. We need to be better versions as, of ourselves. We need to expect more of ourselves individually. And Gandhi said that. You cannot have social change until you take personal responsibility. Oh my gosh. That is so true and so amazing, Bandana. This is, has been such a wonderful hour with you. Thank you so much for sharing. We're going to be, I'm going to be hitting, tapping you to come back and talk to you more because there's just so much 
knowledge and so much experience and so much wonderful beauty inside of you. Thank you so much for joining us and everybody. In the jungle on my own. <laughs> well, Sitting alone. Oh no, you're. We're all here with you. We're all here with you, and we're going to invite the community from Latin American Fashion Summit to to join with you and continue this conversation. And we're just so grateful and so thankful for everything that you've contributed to the world, to the universe, now and in the future. So thank you so much. Happy, happy Earth Day. And we will be checking back to continue this conversation with you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bandana. Thank Bye, you everyone. So thank you, Patrick. What a I'm day for Earth Day. I love it. I'm sad to go. I want to stay. I'm sad to go. Bye. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be sharing a little bit more with about these other questions. So I'll, I'm going to send those to Bandana and we'll follow up in an email tomorrow. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.